if you overtreat them or if you treat them accidentally or you treat them asymmetrically, you're going to get a side effect which is extremely noticeable. Welcome to the Aesthetics Mastery Show. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Hi, I'm Miranda Pierce. And today we're talking about lower face muscles. Very important for advanced Botox. We're going to cover some key concepts, muscles you need to know, and several tips and tricks that I've been teaching for years. So give us an overview of the lower face muscles we need to know about. There's a lot to take in, so prepare yourself. But also, if you have faith that you're going to learn something from the show, please give us a like now. It'll also make sure that YouTube shows you future videos next time you log on. First of all, you, let's think about the face um, as a, on a higher level. So before we dive into the detailed anatomy, what's actually going on in the lower face? So the lower face is much more complicated than the upper face, I think. And obviously, eyes are a very delicate structure, and there's a lot of interesting anatomy there. But the actual function of the upper face is, broadly speaking, nonverbal communication and protection of the eyes is, is how I understand it. So you can close your eyes tight and you can protect them. But there's not actually a lot of other stuff compared with the lower face. Where the lower face, we have mastication, um, we also have um, speech, and uh, and then nonverbal communication as well. So it's doing all these things all the time. Uh, well, maybe not all the time, but certainly at different times, you're, you're doing all of these functions. So it's a lot more complex. It's a lot more mobile. Do you think about how much movement is, there is in the lower face compared with the upper face? Um, it's a, In most people, it's a lot more mobile. So... Um, Lot, many more different variations and nuances, I think, um, but it all starts really with understanding the anatomy of the muscles, if you're going to understand the movement. So talk us through the layout of the lower face muscles. So there's some, there's some interesting differences with the muscles in the lower face compared with other muscles in your body. Um, if you think about what the average muscle is doing, is it's connecting bone to bone. So most of the, the other muscles, uh, when you contract them, there's an insertion and an origin point, which te tends to be bone to bone. What's different about the face in particular is that you have a, lo a lot of muscles connected either to other muscles or into the skin. And that's because there's so much movement required. And um, that depends which part you look at. I'm talking mainly in this case with the anterior face. So the anterior face, all those muscles that control the mouth and elevate the lip and, uh, and, there, and even move the chin are all skin to bone so, or bone to skin, depending on the way you're looking at it. Um, the muscles of mastication are a bit different. They are the classic bone-to-bone -bone connections, and you don't see those connections in the surface of the skin. So that's the first general layout. Uh, when we cover the fat pads, which is an another video you should have a look at, um, th this is why there's this interesting layout where the muscle and the fat pads are like tiles on a roof, where they're stacked together, and the deep fat pads are actually on top of other muscles. So yeah, check that video out, and they'll tell you more about that. Uh, but that's the first thing that's different about the muscles in the face, is that is that they don't have that classic uh, connections that the rest of the skeletal muscle does. The next thing is to think about like what, how are they actually supporting and holding the structures. And I, I kind of think about a lot of the mid face being basically hanging off the zygoma and the maxilla. So all the, all those bone, bony attachments are either on the maxilla or the zygoma, and they're hanging the, the mouth, the nose, um, the chin is all supported on those muscles anteriorly. Um, and I do kind of almost imagine it being sort of hanging there supporting. But there are obviously elevators and depressors, which we'll look at in detail. So tell us about the elevators. So these are the muscles that lift the mouth almost directly up, basically. Um, the zygomatic major, for example, is sometimes not included on the diagrams, but it, it's also an elevator. It's just more pulling the corner of the mouth rather than pulling directly upwards. The core elevators we need to know are the levator labii elequinasi muscle medially. Then there's the levator labii superioris, the levator anguli oris, and zygomatic minor. And those muscles are all doing very many interesting things uh, different expressions. So obviously they're they're involved slightly in smiling. Uh, they're also involved in some looks of disgust, for example. Um, they're definitely involved in the really big expressions if you're smiling a lot. And the, the the time when we treat them is usually with gummy smile. If you're treating either with toxin or with dermal fillers, if you're trying to moderate the degree of movement in that area, it's those muscles that you're trying to dampen or reduce their strength. So are there any side effects we need to worry about with the elevators? So yes, absolutely. If you if you overtreat them or if you treat them accidentally or you treat them asymmetrically, you're going to get a side effect which is extremely noticeable because if if you cause any problem with a patient's smile, it's very very obviously uh, obvious to their friends and family and to them. And obviously your smile is a very important thing. So an asymmetrical smile is a fairly devastating side effect um, of treating a little bit too much on one side or the other. So 
Classically, this happens when people inject the orbicularis oculi muscle a little bit too deeply, go all the way through the fat pad and hit the origin of the zygomatic major. So that would be a really awful side effect where you get an asymmetrical smile. Similarly, with gummy, with gummy smile treatments, if you're trying to relax the levator labii like the nasi muscle, then if you get that asymmetrically, you might get one side that lifts and the other that doesn't. And much more subtly than that is a slightly odd smile. Now, the interesting thing about gummy smile is you can often get a brilliant before and after picture that looks amazing for, you know, for showing clients what's possible, but the patient themselves really doesn't like it. And it's because of the dynamic nature of a smile that if you smile, but you're suppressing the elevator, it can, to their people who know their faces really well, it can just look either insincere or a bit odd. And o over the years, you know, talking over 12 years, I've had a handful of patients who haven't liked it because every time they smiled, people know them well, say, what, are you being sarcastic? Are you not quite, you know, because it just doesn't seem like their normal smile. So it's worth building into the, into the consultation that even if you get a technically brilliant result, that it may look, it may take some getting used to, let me put it that way. And in a percentage of patients, it may not be worth the benefit that they get. And you might want to try a different method, for example, using dermal filler. So that sounds a bit tricky. Is there anything that we can do to prevent it? It sounds like if we do our best, that might still happen, the gummy smile. Yeah, well, that one in particular is tricky because it's more of a familiarity type um, experience. So it's when, and there are many patients who are very happy with the result themselves and they don't care what their friends and family think. And there are others who don't like the every time they smile, people saying not getting them. So uh, you need to build it into the consultation. And the other thing is I've over the years reduced my dose right down. So I only use for a first pass on a new patient, maybe one unit each side. Um, whereas some people would use four units. And and that's only because I, I would rather just top them up. Like I said last week, I, I like to take the approach of it being a journey rather than a destination. New patients, I'm more than happy to treat them with a low dose and see them again one more time to get them happy without any downside. Um, and once you know them, you can up the dose. Or at least keep going with the dose you know is safe. So the side effect's quite scary where you'd be treating crow's feet and end up affecting the smile. Are there any other treatments that might affect the smile well yes actually there's another actually relatively common i think for the percentage of times the treatment is done is um is when you're treating the master if you get a little bit superior and a little bit medial then you can affect the resorius muscle and that causes sometimes an even more upsetting asymmetry of smiling and that that's basically because you're relaxing a little muscle that pulls the corner of the mouth uh, when you do a big smile so what can we do to avoid that so yeah, one of the problems I realized with this is if if you Google um, master reduction Botox pattern or injection points for toxin, you get a very common description that if you actually look at the lines, which I'm sure we can get up on the screen for you, um, you'll see that the line that is often used draws a line um, right to the oral commissure. And if you look at the top kind of right hand side of where that line is inferior to it, you're actually very close to the insertion point of resorius. And I know from training clinicians that um, when you see them in practice trying to implement these things, it's only half a centimeter to centimeter different and you're right in the resorius. So I don't like using that line. In fact, I use a different line, which is to really line up with the mental crease. So you're treating the lower third of the master muscle, but my boundary is the mental crease. And that takes you away from that insertion point of resorius, which I think is likely to reduce the number of side effects of this smile of the smile being affected with a toxin treatment in master. So when you're injecting the masseter, what do you do to reduce that risk? Apart from using a different boundary, which means I'm less likely to inject near that insertion point of resorius. The other thing that's really important when injecting the masseter to avoid that particular side effect, as well as another side effect, is to make sure that you're deep enough. So if the, the actual resorius muscle is inserted into the fascia around the master. So it's relatively superficial. Um, and so if we make sure we're deep, that's the second thing you can do. So we need to be inferior to it and too deep to actually hit the resorius is, is an effective way of reducing that risk. You said another side effect? Oh, yes. Yeah. So there's, a, there's a, an odd side effect that happens, particularly with people with really big masters. And uh, I've had a couple of these referred to me over the years where they've actually had a really good result initially, often with really enormous master muscles. Um, and then a few weeks later, after it's kind of kicking in, they get a bump that forms on the surface uh, of the master. And really what's happening is you've got the deeper layers of the master actually herniate through the atrophied muscle at the top. 
Um, thankfully, that the ones I've seen have been resolved quite quickly with just an additional injection, but it's another reason to be deep. So in order to inject more deeply, you can either compress the muscle when you're injecting, or better still is to use longer needles, particularly in patients with bigger muscles, because the bigger the muscle is, the more chance you'll be in the more superficial part of the fiber, uh, and the more chance you'll get these side effects. So injecting the master is sometimes called jawline slimming, but effectively you're atrophying the muscle to create a more feminine, often it's a more feminine shaped face, but if you're masculine, but you're wider, lower than your cheeks, um, then you might also want to do it. And it's not feminizing, it's just balancing. So if you haven't already watched my interview with Dr. Ruth Brady, it's worth checking out. She goes into ex some extremely interesting detail on what actually could be causing mat masseter hypertrophy. And it's to do with malocclusion. And there may be many dental referrals that actually need to come off the back of these aesthetic consultations if you're going to get a, a complete um, solution to the problem. Because the, the theory is, in summary, and this is a very brief summary of a complex problem is that malocclusion causes biting particularly during the night it's one of the, one of the causes of bruxism is that just that sensation of your teeth touching if you have a slight malocclusion uh, problem can cause you to bite quite often and that causes hypertrophy so sometimes there's a dental problem that needs to be solved ahead of the aesthetic problem which is how patients present so worth learning about any other tips for injecting the masseter? So uh, don't just inject it because someone is wider, lower down. I've, I've met a few patients who've had treatments like that, and obviously they fail because there, there's many reasons why you can be wider, lower down other than your master. It's usually a fat pad. Sometimes it's the shape of your jaw. Um, but similarly, don't assume that it's the fat pad because I've also had some really rewarding treatments done on younger girls with big masters who think that they're fat and in examining them you can feel that they've actually got this big muscle and then treating them is a very fast process to slim them down and, and had some really amazing results that made them really happy so feeling is the key get them to bite down feel the shape and size of the muscle and with experience you'll you'll start to spot it even before you examine it it has a different shape to fat so we talked about elevators. What about depressors? So yeah, the muscles that pull the, the corner and the midpoint of the mouth down are important to understand. We actually treat them sometimes and sometimes they get treated by accident and they cause side effects. Um, so the first one to know about is the, the depressor angularis oris and this pulls down the corner of the mouth as you can tell by the name. Uh, and that's the one that you can often treat just slightly weaken and it can elevate the corner of the mouth um, as an alternative to supporting that with filler or someone who just has a dominant muscle in that area. So how would you diagnose whether or not they need Botox or fillers? So you're looking for a hyperdynamic element. So during expressing, if you see someone who's kind of pulling down, I think like Robert De Niro is a bit like this. He's got that slight downward pull. Obviously, he's, he's getting on a bit, so some of it's age. But there's a there's a definite hypertonic uh, component to what pulling down. Sh Cherie Blair has something similar, but it's more of, of her depressor labii. So that pulls this, this more um, directly inferior down rather than down and lateral. Um, so just start to look at people's faces and see what they're like during movement. And you're just aiming to add a bit of harmony to the right people and it's a small dose. And um, But I wouldn't necessarily use it to treat everyone who has a downturn mouth because a lot of them it's fat loss and it's aging. And you might want to be thinking more holistically with dermal fillers as well as your other treatment options, including toxin. So tell us about that side effect that we might cause on the downturn mouth without meaning to. So yeah, so the downturn mouth treatment, it's a bit like what happens with gummy smile in that it might look okay to people who don't know you, but the people who do know you, it can change the character of your smile. If you think about what's happening, if you're treating the, the depressors and you're not treating the elevators, when you smile, you might be showing a lot less of your, of your teeth lower down and you get a, a smaller smile and it also a smile that pulls up more. So the actual position of your mouth changes proportionally more than if you have the the balancing force of the of the depressors fully active which is what they are in the untreated phase so it just looks different it can sometimes look a bit jokery so you get too much elevation laterally and medially um, not so much and so it, it curves up too much these are all very subtle things that people i wouldn't say that each treatment you do you're likely to see it but um Occasionally, patients who study themselves or they get a bit of feedback from that, they'll, they'll realize that they don't like it as much as they may have casually looked at themselves. Because a lot of what happens with your face is quite complex, the movement's complex, and the people, you're not even always conscious of it yourself um, until it's developed. You mentioned asymmetry. Tell us more about that. Well, yeah, the problem is you, it's quite common to get asymmetry because you're trying to only partially relax a muscle. That always makes it harder. Um, and secondly, there are, there are 
these muscles are very closely overlapped. So depress, especially the depressor angularis oris and the depressor labii, they're, um, the more inferior you go, the more overlapped they are. And there, there is definitely a technique being taught where they teach you to inject along the jawline. And I think this is responsible for many um, slightly bad side effects. Um, well, certainly just not the best optimal result, let me put it that way. And it, you, you'll see this with asymmetry, and it's because you affect the depressor labii and the depressor angularis oris, or, both, or one of them more than the other. Uh, and you end up with a smaller smile when you do smile because there's nothing pulling your lower, lower lip down. If you, if you picture a full smile, there's an element of pulling the lower lip down and pulling the upper lip up. And if you, if you knock out one of those, you get a, uh, an asymmetry to that um to, the, to that line caused by your lower lip and it's very very eye-catching unfortunately so if your lips suddenly askew against your teeth people notice it immediately and so that that's a you you need to be i think there's a better technique which we can talk about um which i've been using that doesn't cause that uh, the same um frequency of a problem i think what what's we trying to treat when when that happens well we're trying to treat depression of the mouth so it's it's sad face so hypertonic. Sometimes we, I do it with uh, with Bell's palsy because you get hypertonic um, muscle contractions with that, and if you relax it, it can make a really good difference. So um, it can be it can be a asymmetry or it can just be a, a heaviness to the mouth at any age, um, but usually it's older people. Um, and then you're 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 just trying to relax it just enough so that the elevators pull up and you get a more pleasant aura. Put it that way. Relax it too much and you get a joker smile. Uh, don't relax it as much on one side or the other and you get brow, you get asymmetry. Affect the depressor labia instead of the depressor angularis oris and you get this asymmetrical lower lip um, when you smile. Um, so there are lots of things to consider. I feel like I've said a lot of bad things can happen. Most of the treatments work out well, otherwise we wouldn't do it at all. Um, but it's definitely complex. That's why it's normally as part of an advanced toxin course. So you mentioned a few minutes ago that the uh, technique that you use that that, that avoids the side effects. Well, yeah, I mean, it's not it's not a technique I've invented, but it's the the, the two versions I see taught. Are, one is that you inject along the angle of the jaw, so you're looking for that path of depressor labii and where it inserts, you inject. But unfortunately, underneath that, you have depressor labii, so depressor angularis oris and depressor labii overlap near their insertion. So you're just much more likely to affect depressor labii if you're injecting close to the jaw. I think it's better to move up about halfway between the oral commissure and the jawline and feel for it. You can actually, if you ask your patient to contract, you can actually feel that boundary because behind that there's, there is a little bit of buccinator muscle, uh, buccinator, um, but that's, and maybe resorius, but there's not an awful lot of other stuff. So if, you, if, if you're injecting um, at the right point, you should only, and with a small dose, you should hopefully only affect that depressor muscle. Tell me about this buccinator. <laughs> So, I mean, the buccinated muscle is not a muscle that we ever intentionally treat, but you need to be aware of it. It's uh, the the buccal fat pad is sandwiched between the buccinator and the resorius. And if you're ever trying to replace volume in that area, you might be um, using that as a guide. Um, the only interesting fact I know about it is that it's the strongest muscle in babies because that's what they suck with. Um, and it's just one of the strongest muscles in a, in a baby's body, apparently, when they're you know, a couple of months old and they're into the swing of things. So it's it's used for sucking. Um, but it's not really that involved with aesthetic injectables anyway. And moving on down to the platysmal bands, what do we need to know about them? So this is a very superficial muscle. It's like a sheet, but then it collects into these bands um, and essentially you can relax it. It can be, it's, it's connected into the SMAS. So if you relax it, sometimes you see an improvement in jawline. So it can really make a good difference. And, and that's why it's called the, the Nefertiti lift if you do a toxin treatment is that you you create that Nefertiti type jawline uh, in a percentage of people. Um, side effects, uh, similarly actually to treating the lower face is if you occasionally I've seen a few people get asymmetry in their lower mouth and it's because the muscle isn't actually as neat as it is in the textbook and it's often woven into those depressors and you can you can sometimes see it, you know, the depressor angularis oris and the platysmal band are kind of woven together. So occasionally get people get asymmetry when they smile. I think it's when you're injecting very high up, um, but it's worth knowing about. Any other general tips for the lower face muscles? Well, consultation is very important. You need to be preparing your patients for the subtleties um, of these treatments. So many of the side effects and even the results I've talked about um, 
that there are some subtleties that they need to be aware of. It's not a here's your injection and you'll be happy. You may you may there may be an adjustment period. So consultation is very important. Um, the other thing is just be be precise with your doses. Feel the muscles. I don't think you should be thinking that you need to know where the muscles are just by memory. Like actually feel for what you can. Um, do small amounts on your first pass, and you can always add more later. And then when you when you understand that particular patient you can go up to the textbook dose. Um, that's a good way to start because if you go too heavy on some of these more subtle treatments, um, you'll lose patients and they won't be happy. And that's that's obviously our our reason to be is that we make our patients happy. So um, slowly think of it as a journey, small doses, feel the muscles, and that should put you on a really good course to getting good results with advanced toxin. So thank you to everyone who's liked this video already. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on this great free content that we're putting out each and every week. And if you would like a reference for all of the important muscles in the face for your aesthetics practice, then Tim has created a beautiful muscles poster and the link is down below. Thank you for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.